Good morning. How's everyone doing today? The Gospel of John and chapter 4 will be our text, verses 31 through verse 42. Cold as a tax collector's heart out there this morning. My dad used to say that. You realize we are like less than two weeks from Thanksgiving, and then it's like Christmas time, and then New Year's, and then pitchers and catchers report, and spring training, and we just do this whole thing over. Like, it happens, like, so fast. Um, However, you're not here today by accident, that God actually, in his sovereignty, arranged and ordained uh, you to be here on this day as we lifted our voices to sing holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We get a glimpse and we look forward to that time when we just fall on our faces before the Lord and we need to prepare for that moment and we prepare for that moment, this moment, today. Um, let's, let's, let's pray. We're going to pick up this text uh, basically where we left off last week in the narrative of um, the woman at the well. And we'll kind of build on that as we continue on in our series, what I call Rescue. Let's bow our heads and pray, ask for the Lord's help and guidance this morning. Father, we do come um, bowed in your presence, and we thank you so much. I thank you for this day, the beauty of the sunrise. I thank you for every uh, person that is here. And Father, we are most grateful that you are with us and that your word is before us. And I would ask right now through the amazing and powerful ministry of the Holy Spirit um, that you would enlighten our lives with, with this text, illuminate as we would head to the basement with a flashlight and we see all the cobwebs. We see dark corners. I just pray, Lord, that you would reveal areas in our life that need to be swept out and cleaned out so we can be vessels used for your glory. Father, I do lift up uh, Pastor Stewart and all of our junior high students and leaders as they're on uh, retreat. Uh, Lord, make this, Lord, uh, a, a time that they learn and grow in their faith. I pray, Lord, for Pastor Aaron as he is uh, with his staff and those on the New Life Retreat. I would ask, Lord, for protection and allow, Lord, your, um, your word to go forth in the hearts and lives of those students. And Father, for each one of us now with, with your word before us, may you speak. Please guide me every single step of this journey over these next few moments. May everything, everything that is said and done be for your glory and yours alone. We ask this in the strong and powerful name of our Savior, the Messiah, Jesus. Amen and amen. <clears throat> the patriarch um, of the Holcomb family, his name was, was Joe Holcomb. Uh, he is 86 years old. Last Sunday, almost at this very hour, um, he lost children, um, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. In all, there were nine members of his extended family that were killed, um, including an unborn child in the shooting that took place just last Sunday at First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs in Texas. Um, he was asked to to comment on it. 86 years old, this is what Joe Holcomb said. It's of course going to be difficult. It's of course going to be difficult, Holcomb told the newspaper. But we are Christians. We have read the book and we know the ending and it's good. They're in heaven and they're a a lot better off than we are. I, I just, I can't even imagine, I cannot fathom um, having to experience something such as that man and, and many in that church 
face. You, you cannot speak like that. You can't use words like that in a broken world unless you know something. Unless you know someone. Realize as a church, we've been journeying through this series. The past several weeks, we've been focusing on the importance of telling others who that someone is. You realize that? That someone is Jesus, the savior of the world, as we'll see in our text this morning. We've been learning about the fact that we live in like a bad news world. It's broken all around us. And yet there is what? Even in the midst of that, there is amazingly great news. Although we are sinners, God created us in his sovereignty and placed Adam and Eve in a garden and they chose to sin. As a result of that, there's sin that continues to just what? Just, just, just reveal itself in gross, ugly ways every single day. And yet we know that God came to us and he, he lived in such a way that was absolutely perfect without any sin. He loved us, he died, he rose again, and he offers hope, and he offers healing for every single one of us if we trust him. Jesus rescued us from our sin. Not so we can rescue others, it's impossible for that to happen. But what? So we can introduce others, so we can speak all the time loud and clear about that one, Jesus, the Savior of the world. Last week, we were in this story, the early part of John chapter 4, about a woman who was rescued from her lostness, who's rescued from her pain and her sin. We we don't know her name. We're not given her name. She's simply known in John chapter 4 as the woman at the well. Jesus en route from Jerusalem north up to Galilee stops. He's just, just thirsty. He just stops for a drink of water along Jacob's well, and he meets this gal who is really there at an odd time of the day. Usually people would not go at the sixth hour noontime. She really didn't want to bump into anyone. She didn't want to see anyone. You know those moments in our life where we really just don't want to bump into anyone. This particular woman was a scorned woman, married multiple times. She had been, in a sense, passed around from man to man, like property. She was hurting religiously, just cold and indifferent. But thankfully, she meets this one who she is, what, given a lesson that, that, that he is the living water. And she trusts him. And she goes, it says that she leaves her water pot, the reason that she came to the well, and she goes and she tells everyone about this one. That if you know him, if you trust him, you will never, ever, ever thirst again. It says that many people believed because of this woman's testimony. Let's pick up the story where we left off. We pick it up in in verse 31, John chapter 4, verse 31. We'll read down through verse 42. I think the words will be on the screen. You can follow along as I read. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work, his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. 
They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Okay, there's two groups. Okay, both of them are interacting with Jesus. Okay, let's look at this text and we'll listen to it and Lord willing, learn from it. The first group is this. Number one, Jesus shows the disciples the work of the gospel is urgent. There's the first group that he's spending time with. Jesus shows the disciples the work of the gospel is absolutely urgent. Look, lift up your eyes and see. The fields are white for harvest. Now, if you recall, last week, the disciples had gone into town, a bit of a food run. And they returned, and and it says that they, in verse 27, we read it last week, they were marveled at the fact that he was talking with this woman. They come back, maybe they unpacked their little knapsacks, and they've got some simple food, some bread probably, and dried figs. And fish, nothing fancy. And typical, they probably sit down together. They're in a circle. They're close. These guys love to be with one another. They're talking and they're laughing. And they notice that Jesus is not eating, is not partaking with them. And, and there's a degree of concern. And so they urged him. It says, Rabbi, uh, eat. Eat. Jesus Never waste a second. Like, you know those seconds that we waste, those minutes that go by like we didn't really? Jesus never misses a teaching moment. He quickly responds and he says to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And I love these guys because they remind me of myself that I'm a slow learner. And we have to hear something more than one time. And, and, and it says the disciples said to one another, has someone brought him something to eat? They're like stuck on this food subject. I honestly think that they think that Jesus is getting a little woozy here. Like it's getting, what, he's getting a little lightheaded. When you've not eaten for a while, you get a little bit weird. I think the disciples were thinking like somebody's really got to get some figs into this guy. Jesus says this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, what Jesus is saying is this, is that I am completely satisfied. I am nourished and I am strengthened simply by doing what I have been called, what I've been sent by my heavenly father to do. Part of me thinks that the disciples, somebody there starts to roll his eyes. Somebody is thinking, oh man, here we go again. Thomas, put the bread down. Here comes a lesson. I can see Peter like, come on boys, listen up. Here it comes. Here it comes. Jesus uses another word picture. He uses what? An illustration. He uses a a metaphor in order for us to to grasp something, an object lesson, simple things. He's used water and bread and light and a door and vine throughout the Gospel of John. Today, uh, it's going to be a harvest field. Jesus says this, Did you not say, or do you not say, uh, the New International Version actually translates it like this, Don't you have a saying? It's probably a proverb of their time. And this is the proverb of their time. It's still four months until harvest. There are yet four months, or there are still four months, which means what? It's pretty obvious. From the time that seed is put into the ground until the time of harvesting, it's typically in this arid Middle Eastern what climate, about four months. In, in Pennsylvania, we're looking more at five to six months. But Jesus is saying this, you guys think that you've got some time on your hands. You guys are like sitting here, what, eating together, thinking, well, we've got four months. Let's just take breather. 
Jesus is, is looking at them and saying, you guys think it's okay to kind of put your feet up and take a break. And he says, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Because as he was speaking, and he knows his entire scene before him, as he was speaking, there were literally, what, crowds of Samaritans that were leaving the towns, and they were walking across the fields, coming toward him. It said earlier in verse 30, Jesus says, look, I tell you, you lift up your eyes and see. Look at this. You, you, guys, you guys want to kick back for a while. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and, and gathering fruit for eternal life. So the sower and the reaper rejoice together. The saying is true. And he adds this picture. One sows, another reaps. I've sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into it. Means what? The work is progressively going on and you are being inserted into it by my word and by my authority. We read that and before it's very easy for us to kind of like, okay, I think James and John, the brothers here, like, can I have some more figs, please? Like, I don't know if, if they entirely get this picture. Reason being is we have, we have, again, two groups. We have a bit of a split screen approach. Two different scenes happening, in a sense, simultaneously. Work with us here. The Samaritan woman we know has trusted Christ, immediately goes into the town, tells others. And at this moment, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So we have people that are coming. The disciples are already sitting there. The disciples back from their food run, hoping for a little bit of rest and refreshment. And Jesus is teaching them. He's telling them what? It's not about you guys getting more food. It's not about you guys getting what you want. You're entering something that is already moving, that I have set up, that I have already established. Remember that gal that you saw me talking to? He's teaching them. Remember how how she left? Remember how excited she was? Remember the water pot that's sitting right here? Remember how she told everyone everything and now those people have heard it are now coming. Look, look at those fields. It is probably the time for harvest that wheat, we know when it gets ready to be harvested, it gets right, it begins to bend over and it gets a really light golden color when the sun hits it from a distance, it almost looks like it's white. What's interesting as well is that many people, some of the harvesters who actually coming to the field would wear light clothes or white clothes because it was, it was cooler than wearing dark clothes. And as people were coming across, he's like, look at that. Do you understand what's happening right here? People were coming. Samaritans were coming. And there's an urgency to the work that is set up. Why? Because it's time for the harvest. And if you don't harvest... What happens to the crops? What happens if you just kind of leave it there? What if it, if it leans a bit and then it bends and falls and you miss this little season? Then everything is spoiled. Jesus is saying that there is a window right now, right here, right here is this window and you have a moment to do and be obedient to what you've been called to do. Let's take the mirror of God's word and let's hold it up for us to see. Why are you here this morning? Like you, you, you obviously had to brush your teeth this morning. You got up, hit the snooze 18 times. We talked about that. We had a whole conversation about how many times you hit the snooze. Once today, that was it for me, just once. I didn't make it all the way through the nine minutes. Why are you here? A lot of times, we, we, if we were gut honest, we're here at some level to get something. That's why we come. According to scripture, that's not why you're supposed to be coming. You are here to give. The, the, the mindset is what? You don't come to church to get. You, you come to give. First of all, you just give up yourself. Lord, I'm just here. I'm here for you. I'm, I'm here to hear from you. I'm here to be an encouragement to other people. You're not, you're not here to sit. 
for these few moments, sure, but you are here to serve. The time is urgent and it is pressing. We don't have to look too far. We don't have to go too far to realize that this is like broken and busted all around us and people need to hear good news. And it says what? One, one sows and another reaps. I have um, something that is brought to me on a regular basis. There, there's, um, we have people who work inside the church, particularly with younger people, have to have background clearances, background checked, very, very thorough. And, and what happens sometimes is that we have younger people, 12, 13, 14, that want to serve in some capacity. And so they have to have a, a background check even from, from, from their um, young age. And they also fill out a little testimony as far as why they want to serve the Lord. Okay, everyone has a job to do. And so I had some brought before me just this past week. And, and this is a little one who just simply says, I just want to serve the Lord. Okay, and she explains why she wants to serve the Lord, what strengths that she brings. A little girl in our church, her name is Maddie, and she says this, um, why would you like to volunteer as a worker for children and, and youth? I think that it would be fun and it would really help the church out. It says, what qualities do you have that would help working with children? This is the response Maddie gives. I'm funny, I'm energetic, I'm sporty, I'm lovable, and I love kids, and I have a little sister. Now, if you hear that for a moment, a lot of times you're like, yeah, well, I'm not really qualified to do anything, and so we just kind of sit. Yet we have a young one who says, you know what? I have a little sister, so if, if I have a little sister and I know how to take care of her, Maybe I can help in another area. I can help in another way. There's another young girl, and she says this. She says, why would you like to volunteer as a worker? Because I love to play with kids, and I think it's a fun experience. What qualities do you have? Because I'm still kind of young, and I know what they like, and I'm used to being around other kids. Realize there's this idea that basically just says what? If I'm here, then I'm going to be serving in some capacity. That the what? That, that the need is now. It's this window of opportunity. One sows and another reaps. Every single one of us, every single one of us are to be busy. Jesus, what? He shows the disciples the work of the gospel is urgent. It's pressing. It's immediate. It is now. Secondly, remember the other scene, remember the other split screen, the other group, Jesus stays with the Samaritans because of the work of the gospel is important. Not only is our work urgent, it's pressing, it's immediate, it's now, but it's an important message. And he proves this through his actions. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him. They asked him to stay with them and he stayed there. Two days. Now you have to realize, again, who were the Samaritans? No one invited the Samaritans to a party. Okay? No one liked the Samaritans. They were simply overlooked. They were passed over. They were lost. They were the least likely to ever listen to anyone. And yet they finally heard about this one. And they heard it from this woman. What I love about scripture is that there are words and phrases that as I read it, it just, it just illuminates. And it kind of surfaces. It comes to the top. And there's five words in this little section that we just read that I thought, I think we missed this. Samaritans from that town believed. And they said, would you just like hang here for a while? Like people don't normally give us any time. People don't normally like listen to us. People don't normally go out of their way, talk to us. And we heard about you and we'd like to hear some more. There's five words that says what? He stayed there two days, two days I'm just kind of backing up a little bit. Wait a minute. Wasn't Jesus, he, was, he began his journey in Jerusalem. He's steaming north. 
Doesn't he have like places to be? Wasn't he heading somewhere specific? Didn't he have some obligations, some commitments? Didn't he have a busy schedule? Didn't he just stop here for like a rest, just like off the beaten path for a second to get a drink, to be refreshed? Yeah. And yet he knows that at this very moment is the time that these people need to be offered what? Instruction and guidance. They need to be taught. They need to be loved. They need to be given hope. And so as he is modeling what ministry, this is what it looks like for his disciples, he just says, boys, we're just going to settle here for a while. Sometimes we like pat ourselves on the back because we go out of our way and we give someone that 10 minutes of our time. Two days, he just stayed there. He spent time with them, teaching them more. No, no doubt, listening to them. No one had ever listened to them. No doubt, spending time praying with them. Could, could I ask you this? Do you do that? Like take the time out. Maybe it's not even scheduled time, but take the time out to listen to someone. We're talking about the fact that we have this, this good news Talk about the fact that we live in a broken world. We live in a busted community. Talk about the fact that we're here on mission. We know that the, the time is urgent. It's pressing. We've got like a little window here. Do, do, do you uh, like stop everything and pull over to listen and to tell others about the one who rescued us? Do, do you do that? that that's what we are. Jesus is modeling. Jesus is showing us, this is what it looks like. What, what's the text telling us here? What, 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 what is the application for us? It's pretty clear. The task is urgent. Look at those fields that are white. They're coming right now. They're right there. You don't have to wait for someone to be in need of the gospel. It's all over the place. We know what the text is saying. The task is urgent. The message is important. Jesus is the savior of the world, which means what? There's no other savior. There's no other name by which anyone may be saved other than that name. You heard it. You believe it. Why why are you here? To Get, that's not what we see in Scripture. You're here to give. What is this text telling us? Do not wait any longer because the time is now. I honestly feel that in the busyness of our world and we pause on the word and the words of God that we doubt the weight, and we doubt the value. And I think we question and doubt the power that exists in the words of the gospel. I think we question it. And we're relegated to our prayer closets, which is certainly where we should be. And we pray maybe, maybe someday... Maybe, maybe someday there'll be a great movement of the Spirit. Maybe someday there'll be revival in our own community. And we're hoping for like maybe something in the future. Hey, gang, it doesn't look any better than this. You pull the trigger now because you don't know how long you have. Look at the fields. There are people that are in need of good news, of good news. They're everywhere. I'm afraid that we feel that it's our job to sit and to get as opposed to give and to serve. Jesus is indeed the savior of the world. Some of us think, yeah, well, seed went in the ground. I've got four months until the harvest. Well, that's not what the text is saying. 
that, that's not what we're hearing. That's not what we're reading here. It's not what we're to learn from this text. L- look, lift up your eyes and see. One of my favorite um, authors uh, to read um, over the years, and I can honestly go back to probably when I was a teenager to when I was introduced to Charles Haddon Spurgeon, referred to as England's Prince of Preachers. And, And he wrote and he preached with such fervor and such fire. He preached in the 19th century, um, and I was reading this, this very week, a message that he preached on July the 29th, 1866, and it was on this very text. That's why I was reading it, John chapter 4. And the, the title of the message that Spurgeon preached was this, Fields White for Harvest. You know what my first response is? That's a really boring title, like Charles. Like, could you not come up with a little something like that would stick? Something that would click a little bit? Fields, white for harvest? That's pretty original. Put a lot of thought into that. That was my first response. I was like, this, so this is the text? This is the man? And yet as I read that message, a thought occurred to me that one of the reasons that I believe God used him in such amazing ways was because he was so simple. Because he was absolutely clear. He encouraged, as he would oftentimes train young preachers and young pastors, he encouraged what he called simple speech, plain talk about Christ. And he says this, and I quote, plain talk about Christ does still win the ear, and if it is but tried, and it really is the gospel that is preached, there will never be a lack of hearers. Only preach so it can be understood. Take the velvet from your mouths and speak plainly, and they will sure to come and to listen. Do not, of course, expect them to listen if you are not earnest about what you have to say. Not only does he, in a sense, encourage, but he chides us. And he challenges us. His sermon concluded, and I will read to you his conclusion on this very text. And I quote Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers. As I look around this congregation, I cannot help thinking what a mass of strength there must be here for the Lord's cause. If it could be but brought out. Oh, if every talent we possess were but consecrated to Christ, London, you need not be in the dark. We could say what? Lock Haven, you need not be in the dark. If all God's lamps which are in you were but lit. Oh, you mighty city, you need not be ignorant of the gospel if the tongue of every child of God would but tell it out. I charge you. I charge you who love the Lord, I charge you by the nearness of death and by the shortness of time in which you can serve your master, do not one of you be idle. Oh, my dear hearers, I would almost say if you are members of my church here and are doing nothing, get out of what service can you be. You are dregs on the wheels. You are an impediment to the church's course. You are like heavy baggage which impedes the armies of Israel. Do something. In God's name, I charge you, do something or else be ashamed of yourselves. Hasn't Christ done much for you? Do you profess to have been bought with his blood? And are you doing nothing? Some of you drink in the doctrines of grace, but if they are indeed true to you, show the grace of the doctrines by spending and being spent in the master's cause. These then are the needs of the harvest. 
how people um, don't preach like that any longer. But it is so true. It is so, it is such a needed word. It is such a necessary word. Do, do you realize, do you realize that your life affects, that your life impacts others? Every one of you. You have a sphere of influence around you. And I'm convinced that we're, we're missing this window, this little tiny window that right now the fields are white under harvest. Uh, several weeks ago, I came home um, from a meeting and it was late, late at night. It was a Wednesday night. I had been at an elders meeting. And I know that on Wednesday night, I come home and open my garage door. I have to take the garbage out because Thursday morning is garbage day. And so as I was taking my garbage out, I noticed that that in our neighbor's backyard in the back, there were four or five guys sitting around a little campfire back there. And the thought is, I was wheeling my little garbage can out. My thought was, you know, I, I should head over there and spend some time with them. I should sit and talk with them. It was the first thought that came to my mind, but I was late. And I had been done for the day. And I, I, I came in the house and I was telling Wendy and, and, and I said, you know, there's a couple of guys out back and I just felt that maybe I should go. But I said, you know, I've had a long day. I'm exhausted. I'm, and I remember I'm, I'm done. And she said this, and, and I quote, she said, honey, if you feel like you should do it, she said, do it now. Do it now. Do it now. I'm like, oh, you're always right. I took off my little shiny black shoes. I didn't, I didn't want to have shiny black shoes on and be like the weird guy around the fire. You put on some work boots and put it all in a sweater. And I, I took my, I had a little, you know, those little fold up, those little ones that like they're always wobbly. I took one of those little fold up chairs and I walked down around the back and there's four guys dark out sitting around a fire and without saying anything, I just put my chair next to them and just sat down without saying a word, just sat down next to the fire. And, and it wasn't but a minute and someone said, hey, aren't you the preacher? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's me. I'm, I'm the preacher. And we, we began to talk. We just began to talk, talk about the fire and talk about the fall. And I spent about two hours around that fire. You know what's neat is that there's been a young man that comes to second service every single, every single Sunday since that time. His name's Billy. And Billy's learning about the Savior of the world. And and I don't say that in any way to say, oh, you have to be. No, no, I I, I was wrong to say that my day's done. I'm done. Like, I'm it. I'm spent. And to be reminded that there's a window right now that we are not going to have later on. I asked Billy, if I, can I tell you about the way that we met? He's like, Yeah. The day that you like snuck up on us in the night around the fire. I think it's just a great reminder of, of the responsibility that every single one of us, every single one of us have. That the fields are white on a harvest. There's not time to like kick your feet up and pray for maybe someday it's going to look right. No, just like that day that Jesus was talking and today... He is, is the savior of the world. And you have the opportunity to bring good news in a broken world. May we do that and may we do that well. Father, we love you and we ask for your strength as we strive to be obedient. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Tim. Would you stand with us as we close?